way to look at it. So in the southwest part, uh, the streets are perpendicular to the waterfront. And some of the avenue south is a bit weird in that. And that's the quadrant where some of the streets are angled. What is that about? Well, it all begins in really pre-colonial times with nature. Christopher Street was an Indian path because it had a very good um, sandy beach. And that was very good for the Indians going into the water, picking up lobster or oysters, and trading with the Indians of New Jersey. Indians called the, the section Sapo Hanikam, the place of growing tobacco, because that was the first European use of the village. Now, the line here, let's see, this line is also part of the natural topography originally. That is Mineta water. It was a trout stream. The first reason people came to Greenwich Village to visit was to catch trout, of all interesting reasons. Why does it have, oh goodness, I didn't want to do that. Why does the trout stream have this direction? Because there used to be a big sand hill, uh, the top of which would today be the block bounded by Charles and Perry, 4th Street, and uh, Bleecker. And that was at the top of the hill, so the, um, the stream went around it. So here was the original natural line of Mineta and what forms much of the future of that part of town. The first African Americans come to New York in 1626, two years after the Dutch arrived, and the city, the Dutch city of New Amsterdam, was downtown basically south of the wall, today's Wall Street. But uh, there was a lot of money to be made in New Amsterdam in the fur trade. That's why the Dutch first settled in Manhattan, because Henry Hudson had reported there are a lot of fur-bearing animals in town. Well, the first six years the Dutch were in Manhattan, they sent 63,000 beaver and otter pelts back to Europe. So who wants to farm? farm? Farming is very hard work and not quite so remunerative. So in 1644, uh, some of the Africans were given at least half freedom. Half freedom means they were free, their kids not so inevitably free. And, where, and they were given land in the outlying districts, also partly to be a buffer against potential Indian attacks. But where did they live? That's where they were, right next to Mineta Water. And you can tell from the names, if you can see them, Simon Congo of 1644, Paulo D'Angola, gives you a sense of what part of Africa they thought these people came from, Antony Portuguese, and <coughs> the original owners of what is now Washington Square Park were the free blacks of 1644. So it's amazing, they were really the first owners of the neighborhood, and they farmed. Uh, here, by the way, is uh, Christopher Street, and you can see it's a road that becomes uh, an, uh, an edge of a property line. So even though the city was south of the wall, you start, even in 1647, getting big chunks of estates to the north of the property line. And if there was a natural feature, then that was frequently used as a boundary for these estates. So here is the route of Mineta. Part of it came up out of the ground around 17th and 6th Avenue. Part of it comes down this way, turns at Union Square, comes down just above 11th Street, the two tributaries meet. They come in this direction, making a swamp originally of what is now Washington Square, and ended up down here. Because remember, there was the sand hill, so they're going around the hill. and. Um, they say that they, the stream, not visible since even before 1800, helped lay out Mineta Street, Mineta Lane, and Downing Street, even though on this map the stream looks about a block above Downing Street, which is this brown one. So uh, the street line, the edge of the water, also is not quite what it is today. It was out at Christopher Street. Christopher Street seems to have the least landfill to the west of it. 
many of them were closed here. And here we have this. So here you see the, the pattern of the street. It came down Manetta Street and turned on to Manetta Lane. <coughs> Trinity Church had a lot to do with Greenwich Village, at least the southwest court. Now, uh, Trinity Church, during the 119 years we were a British colony, was the official Anglican Church of New York. It didn't mean you had to be Anglican, but everybody's taxes helped support Trinity. In 1705, Queen Anne of England gives Trinity a little endowment of land, 215 acres of land, in case they ever want to start a college, which they do in 1754. Before the revolution, it was downtown, it was called King's College, and after the revolution, it was called Oh, yeah. <laughs> so here you see the present Trinity Church. This didn't go up until 1846, although the graveyard is uh, predates even the first Trinity Church. The first Trinity Church on the site goes up in 1703, and this is what Queen Anne gave them. This northern edge is today Christopher Street. So the part of the village was this whole big chunk and then they own the lot down here as well. Today, they are still one of, the Episcopal Church is still one of the 10 largest landowners in the city. Um, up there includes the Catholic Church, Columbia, and not surprisingly, New York University. Yes. Now, the first Trinity Church went up in a set fire at, uh, at the start of the American Revolution, the fire demolished almost everything that had been built downtown in the previous century and a half, including the first Trinity Church. This was a very famous picture of the time by an artist named Thomas Barrow. And so it's in the Trinity Church quadrant that we have Barrow Street. But after the Revolution, Trinity was allowed to keep some of this land but uh, the law said that they had to divest themselves of much of it. And so what they do is, oh, you see a lot, uh, what Trinity mostly owns these days is Hudson Square in the area west of Soho. And many of uh, building, I think they have about a dozen buildings over there, has this kind of plaque on it. I mean, how many entities go back to 1705 that Trinity Real Estate does? Uh, but after the revolution, the, the Trinity laid out its streets, here's Barrow right here at the top, and laid out these other streets and then turned them over to the city of New York. The city extended those streets at an angle, and that's what this angle represents, Trinity Church's property line of 1705. And so you have this charming look favored by residents and movie companies in the West <laughs> Village that none of them know it's the new church's property line. Now, you know, Hay Face in Hudson Street and St. Luke in the Fields over there. Now, the Northern <coughs> Quadrant has all different kinds of names, and these, uh, each of them has a different uh, origin. And uh, here you have. Hudson Street, Greenwich Street, Washington Street, bisecting them. So how did that neighborhood all come about? Well, this is the guy that owned the whole neighborhood in 1740. You're looking at Peter Warren, later Sir Peter Warren. In fact, Warren Street downtown was the river road to Warren's property. He came from County Meath in Ireland, he, uh, went to sea as a young man, uh, ends up being an incredibly successful privateer. This was the British colonial period, and a privateer meant he preyed on the ships that were enemies of uh, England, and he was so successful at it, particularly at Lewisburg off of uh, Nova Scotia, that uh, the British kept rewarding him. Look at how successful he looks in this picture. Uh, kept rewarding him with uh, money, and he ends up owning 300 acres of Greenwich Village. Uh, what happens to him is he ends up going back to Great Britain. 
becomes, uh, represents Westminster in part. That is what Peter Warren owned. Christopher Street on the south, if you'd like a moment to think of the price of one condo. <laughs> And uh, all the way over to Washington Square Park, right here. This is all his property. His brother-in-law owned this section north of 14th Street. His brother-in-law was Oliver Delancey, uh, a member of the, the most important Tory family, just to say they were on the wrong side of the revolution at that time. So he built his house. If you could build it anywhere, which he could, where would you build it? Top of the hill. So uh, he actually comes in and purchases this house in 1740. It was bounded by the block I mentioned between uh, Char Charles and Bleeker uh, and 4th Street and Perry, that block. And from this perch, he could see New Jersey. He could see uh, all kinds of interesting things, the hills of Staten Island. And this house was here until 1865. What's left of it, if you go over to that square block, what's left of it is a block of buildings from 1867. Everything else is earlier, but this building had that block for all those years. So I'm always, you know, my main approach to history of the city, and I do tours of 30 different Manhattan neighborhoods, I have over two dozen different tours just of Greenwich Village, is what is it and how did it come to be that way? And so I'm always interested in and how you can see something that is long gone. This house is long gone, but the age of the replacements is quite interesting. So he goes back to uh, England. He dies the richest commoner in England. And uh, this is his glorious burial place. It is next to Sir Robert Peel in Westminster Abbey. I illegally took this picture for you. <laughs> But sacred to the memory, I mean, he was the richest guy, so he gets a very fabulous tour uh, of grave. Plus, of course, he did a lot to further the designs of England. He had three daughters, and each of them married a man who gave his name to the street in Greenwich Village. Skinner Road used to be an extension of Christopher Street. Fitzroy Place used to be parallel to and east of 8th Avenue, before there was an 8th Avenue. And one of his daughters, <coughs> excuse me, married the Earl of Abingdon. So Abingdon Square is named for his son-in-law. So looking on this map, you see the huge Peter Warren farm and uh, other farms, Herring, the Herring Farm. Uh, Herring was an earlier name for part of Linker Street. And again, along the metal water that is the border of Henry Wood Ward Farm, right over here. Now, what designs, what is the origin for the design of many of the streets in the Northwest Quadrant? Something that is very long gone. On Oliver Delancey's property, about where the old homestead restaurant is today, uh, either Delancey or Warren, nobody seems too sure, put up an obelisk to, uh, devoted to the memory of General Wolfe. General Wolfe, who dies in Quebec, was the general credited with gaining Canada for England. And as a Tory, he wanted to praise him. Now, this big obelisk was a natural destination point for people's uh, uh, walks. And so there were only two ways in this period, which is to say before the American Revolution, after the French and Indian War, which is the war in which Wolf gets uh, Canada, there were only two ways to get to that obelisk. One of them was along the river road, the river road to Greenwich. You came along this way, came up this way, and there you were to see that beautiful monument. But remember, the Nano water ends up in a swamp just above Canal Street, and especially in the springtime, this road was submerged and you couldn't get through. There was only one other uptown route, and that is a road laid out uh, in, by the slaves of the Dutch West India Company in the 1650s. Uh, it was the road to some of the great Dutch farms. What's the Dutch word for farm? Bowery, so I'm talking about the Bowery. You would come up this way, 
Where Astor Place is was a natural sandbar. You'd walk over here. Then you would come to Minetta Water, and there was a bridge across it. And then you would beeline out to the obelisk. So the first two streets in the northwest quadrant of Greenwich Village were the River Road to Greenwich and Monument Lane. Today, they are known as Greenwich Street and Greenwich Avenue. <laughs> Makes sense. And then the streets that connected those two, very logical, very easy to find your way around. And here you see them. Some of the streets have interesting names. Fort Gansevoort. It sounds like, you know, it's in the meatpacking district. It sounds like it has to do with geese. Gans is the word in the Greek, geese, but no. It has to do with a Revolutionary War general, uh, Peter Gansevoort. And in the War of 1812, or Second War, obviously against England, out, uh, out, out at the uh, edge of the island in Greenwich Village, they build the only fort that Greenwich Village has ever had, Fort Gansevoort. And so Gansevoort Street is over there. As famous as Gansevoort was, his grandson came to be even more famous. His grandson was Herman Melville. And for 20 years, Melville couldn't have a lot of time to write because he worked as a custom inspector at the Gansevoort Pier. So interesting history to that name. And uh, there were all kinds of, you know, the lower city was very dangerous, not because of crime primarily, but disease. And in 1790, well, the way it worked is the lower city people were crowded, uh, the disease uh, spread. And if you could afford it in the summer, you moved from lower Manhattan to the country. And in this case, the country meant Greenwich Village. They didn't really understand why there could be yellow fever downtown, but it never hit Greenwich Village. But of course, we know why. It's because of that sand hill. Good drainage means no mosquitoes, which means no yellow fever. So in the terrible yellow fever epidemic of 1798, uh, the Bank of New York decided for two reasons that they should own an outpost in Greenwich Village. One was that one of their clerks in their Wall Street office got hit with yellow fever. But another reason was, why should they suspend operation all through the summer? So they bought, buy a little bit of property, and this is what they build on what is now, what else, Bank Street. That's the origin of Bank Street. Now, this is Joanna Bethune. And a word about naming streets for women. Usually, if they want to do that, they name for the woman's first name. There's an Anne Street, a Catherine Street, a Cornelia Street. Which, what are those family names of those women? It's a little confusing. But in the Northwest Quadrant, we have, uh, for men, they would name the last name for the men. Um, so there are two exceptions, and they're both in the Northwest Quadrant. Joanna Bethune, she lived in, in that area. Bethune Street, obviously, is named for her. And she started an orphan asylum. As a matter of fact, she starts an organization that ends up creating many orphan asylums in New York. You know, it was very dangerous for a lot of people, and kids were either orphans or half orphans, more than we'd like to think. So this is Joanna Bethune. And another person named, who gets a name in the Northwest Quadrant is Horatio Gates. Again, the exception. They're naming Horatio Street for his first name. He was a British officer who, as, as had been George Washington, first a British officer, but he uh, knew how the British operated and was able to win some very decisive victories that were so successful that the French said, you know, maybe these Americans can beat the English, and we're going to come in to help them. So it was very important win, and Horatio Street, this is the Battle of... Uh, which <laughs> Another street named, uh, used to be called Henry Street, but here you see Oliver Hazard Perry. And he, in the Second War, when they won the War of 1812, he was the hero of Lake Erie. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen the enemy, and he is ours, is what he said before Pogo changed that. Uh, here he is. His brother, Matthew Perry, is the guy who opened up Japan for trade with America. But uh, here he is. 
uh, had a very important win for us uh, at Lake Erie. The three southern streets of the Northwest Quadrant used to be called Charles Amos Christopher Street, and all those three are named for one person. He was the son of the manager of Peter Warren's estate, whose name was Charles Christopher Amos. So all three streets get named for him. The northeast quadrant of the village is, of course, the grid plant. And uh, the grid was, you know, the city was pretty much built up to Houston Street by 1811 with certain other villages beyond that. Greenwich Village on the west side that had already been laid out, what I've been telling you was already there, Carmenville, Bloomingdale, other uptown little villages. But the city decided in 1811 to plan for the future. And when you plan something, you have to define what you are working with. Did he define New York as a place of charm? They did not. They defined it as a place of human habitation, real estate. Not surprising to know. And they decided the easiest way to make straight-sided streets would be to come up to superimpose a grid plan over much of Manhattan. They met, the commissioners met for a while at this Western West Village site. This would be Bleecker Street, this would be Christopher Street, and the previous venue, I know the pizzeria isn't there any longer either, but they used to have a sign in the window saying, here's where the commissioners met, and decided to come up with the grid plan. And here you see a map. Actually, it used to be Herring Street before it became Bleecker Street but the office of the commissioners when they were meeting. This is the grid plan on paper in 1811. Now you can see that the lower city here is already laid out to about Houston Street. This is the village right here. And so they start First Street, actually on the east side, just above Houston and on paper, all the way up to 155 streets. People said there are not that many people in China to fill 155 streets, number one. Number two, they said street names, First Street, Second Street, Third Street Avenues, First Avenue, this is boring. And number three, the opponent said that uh, Manhattan is from the Algonquin word, Manhattan means island of hills. How can you superimpose geometry on hills. The city said, not hard for us, we will level and the hills. And that is what the city did. A lot of increasingly brawny men got a lot of jobs leveling the hills. By the way, Central Park was not in it. Central Park would be up here later. This was a parade ground for the militia to do their marching that never really got built. It was from 23rd to 34th Street, from 3rd Avenue to 7th, and only Madison Square Park is part of it, but a small part of it. <coughs> and this is what they went ahead with. Now, once I took this from a helicopter, and it really shows you that the grid plan had a lot of east-west streets. Here, of course, is the United Nations. Here's Newtown Creek with Queens on this side and uh, Brooklyn on this side. But there are a lot of east-west streets, and not that many relatively speaking, uptown avenues. Why is that? Because in 1811, there was very little uptown. And why have a lot of ways to get there? But there was a lot of action and potential action at the waterfront. So whenever you're stuck in traffic, you know, you might want to remember this. This is one of the reasons why. Look at what they had to do. Huge jobs. Uh, they do a lot of uh, valleys and Hills they cut off the tops of most of, and look what anything they had left over they widened the island, and that went on all through the 19th century. So, in 1805, before the commissioners ever met, the second Shehirat Israel Cemetery gets built in Greenwich Village. Now, um, then comes the grid plan of 1811, and by 1829. The surveyors are ready to run 11th Street right through the middle of this graveyard. They say to the congregation, move all the graves. 
But in Orthodox Judaism, there were very few reasons that were permissible uh, that would allow you to move the grain. One was if it was in the middle of a road, but not if it was next to the road. Now, this uh, graveyard had been built at an intersection, that's why it's triangular, that doesn't exist any longer. Uh, this side was Skinner Road. It was an extension of Christopher Street. And this side of the corner, actually I have a better picture here, I took from the new school across the street, this, is, this was called Union Road. And it went from Skinner Road up to basically the West Side Supermarket today at 15th Street and 7th Avenue because that was where it hit Southampton Road. So there were all different roads here before the grid came about. Uh, and the Jewish community sued the city. They said, we will move what's in the way of 11th Street, which they end up moving to 21st Street, still visible, west of 6th. But we're not going to move the others. And that's why a cemetery that has not been interred into since 1829 still makes visitors double take when they pass 11th Street. So imagine a city that would rather come up with what's so weird about the West Road streets, or interesting depending on your point of view. Uh, the grid plan didn't at first, remember this was Christopher Amos Street. Well, Amos Street hit 10th Street now the whole thing was 10th Street with a bend in it. Hammond Street hit 11th Street at Greenwich Avenue. Now the whole thing was 11th Street with a bend in it. Troy Street hit Greenwich Avenue at 12th Street. Now the whole thing was 12th Street with a bend in it. Look at it. If, if 12th Street had continued going without a bend, what would it give you? Little <laughs> West 12th. That's what Little West 12th Street is. Isn't that interesting? This is the interruption right here. So that's part of the reason for the infamously weird uh, street intersections in the West Village, because that wasn't all they did. Um, this section was called Asylum Street for those orphan asylums of Joanna Batu. And where 4th Street hit Asylum Street, we now have 4th Street crossing the other numbers. <laughs> giving you such famous intersections as this. <laughs> there, there's also <laughs> Waverly Place, and Waverly, what's that about? Well, it's all logical if you go back far enough. So on this map, you have Waverly Place. Waverly Place previously had been called 6th six, six Street. It was part of the grid. And it hit Factory Street. But even in the 1850s, villagers were very literary minded. And there were some very popular Scottish novels like Ivanhoe and Rob Roy and Kenilworth. And they were all by Sir Walter Scott. Now, he didn't original, um, immediately say that he was the author, but his first book was, uh, had a protagonist named Waverly, and so they became the Waverly novels. And in 1853, people in the village said to the powers that be, we want something named for the Waverly novels. <laughs> and so Sixth Street gets changed to Waverly Place, and Factory Street gets changed to Waverly Place as well. And so that's how you get <laughs> this weird intersection. This is why people in the village, and especially Greenwich Village Society people, are so intent on keeping bad things that you don't want to happen from happening, because it will make the difference forever. Look at this. Look at this. And there you have that poor building at the intersection of Waverly and Waverly. By the way, this was the old Christopher Street trolley tracks. And of course, that is uh, the Northern Dispenser. Look at the name. It was at the northern part of the city where <laughs> when it was created in 1827, it's been described as the only building in New York with two sides on one street <laughs> and one side on two streets because this is both Christopher Street and North Fourth Street. This thing's very interesting. Well, then you get the Southeast Quadrant. 
And that, look at just from a distance, you can see that those streaks, the, the long ones, go up and down. What is that about? Well, first of all, if the southern boundary, of course, of the village is Houston Street, and Houston Street right there, and we do pronounce it correctly, uh, because it's not named for Sam Houston. It's named for a guy from Georgia named William Houston. He represented Georgia in the Continental Congress at the time of the Revolution, and then he marries into the Bayard family, a very large landowning New York family, and that's how you get your name on a street in the city. So Houston Street. What about these other streets? You have McDougal and Sullivan and Thompson on that side, then you skip one, and then you have Mercer, Green, and Wooster. They are all named for generals of the American Revolution, and they all head to the park named in 1826 for the Commander-in-Chief. What's so important about 1826? The 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. So very, very different looks. Now this was what Mr. Houston looked like. In, in Georgia, there is a county pronounced the way we pronounce the street. They're the only people who think we might be pronouncing it correctly. And Green, Green Street, was named for a general who was captured at, uh, in the Battle of Brooklyn, the greatest loss of life of any battle in the American Revolution. Fort Green, Brooklyn, is named for Green. And here is a huge monument that McKinley and White put up early in the 20th century, a mass grave. Uh, it's quite fascinating to see. Uh, here is Sullivan. Now I think this is, this is the, let's see, this is Sullivan. <coughs> Sullivan at the Battle of Brandywine. He was actually a lawyer, and just by coincidence, NYU built their law school on Sullivan Street. These things happen. <laughs> Mercer, by the way, was a doctor. And uh, this is Hugh Mercer. Uh, he died at the Battle of Princeton, and so that part of New Jersey is Mercer County. So you begin to see these names appear where these characters also had something to do with. Now then you have a street whose name has changed, just its own name has changed a number of times, which just looking at one street tells you about some of the street patterns. And here on this, it is called Lawrence. Lawrence was the head of the Continental Congress, and originally when three generals were, gave their names to one, one side and three generals to the other side, Lawrence was in the middle. Now after World, uh, the Civil War, Boss Creek, very powerful, very corrupt, and uh, I'm just reading a fascinating book right now called Machine Made about the history of Tammany. It's a fabulous name. Uh, new book. Anyway, he bought some property south of Washington Square, and he didn't think that Lawrence was as classy a name as he could come up with. And you know, as you know from how we change uh, neighborhood names, um, it's a way to make prices go higher. So he changes the name, and down to Canal Street. Here, until they throw him out of power, it is called South. Fifth Avenue. It's sort of almost an extension of Fifth through the park, South Fifth Avenue, and yet then you get West Broadway. Well, when they throw him out as a crook in the 1870s, they get rid of the name South Fifth Avenue. There is a building, however, at the northwest, northwest corner of Grand Street that still says South Fifth Avenue because it was built during the days of Tweed. And so they, they changed the whole name to West Broadway. And then in 1953, they again changed the name of the street just from the square to Houston Street, leaving West Broadway south of Houston Street for Fiorello LaGuardia, who was not born on that street. He was born on Sullivan Street. So it's very <laughs> More changes happened. Originally, with the grid plan, 7th Avenue here stopped at Greenwich Avenue. And then you had all these very understandable streets. And down here, just above uh, Houston, Barrett Street begins. But for two very important reasons, around 1920, the city 
connects these two streets into a brand, with a brand new street called Seventh Avenue South. What were the two reasons? Well, they were about you know, the West Side Subway, which in 94, when the subway began, it was only north of 42nd Street. The city decided to extend it south, basically the number one train. Oops. So they connect those two. And it's a lot less expensive digging from the surface of the street than through people's basements. So that's one reason they basically condemned the road on top of the subway. It was quite an upheaval in the village. In the 1920s, you could hardly cross the street. And that reminds me to tell you that before 7th Avenue was extended, Greenwich Village was much more cut off than it is today. You didn't have the subway. You didn't have 7th Avenue coming through. And then there was the Holland Tunnel. Holland Tunnel, that's the other reason that they connect 7th Avenue, sat with 7th Avenue South, because the Holland Tunnel, which was going to open in 1927, the first tunnel in the world to handle cars. If you don't have that well vented, you are dead by the time you get out the other side. So better uptown, downtown access for, I love this picture, uh, <laughs> for the Holland Tunnel. And then you have that wonderful mosaic. Some of you may remember it from the, uh, what street was this on? It was uh, on the garage. This, uh, what street? Broom. I think you're right. I think it was Broom Street. I photographed this beauty. This was erected a year or two before the Holland Tunnel opened. They were so excited it was coming <laughs> that they come up with this fabulous thing. What does that leave us today with 7th Avenue South? Aside from a lot of cabs and cars with New Jersey license plates, that's what you see over there. But you also see, oh sorry, didn't mean to do that. You see all these very weird little triangles between Greenwich Avenue and Houston. That's what's left over when you run a street that didn't quite come about organically. Another thing you see is a very broken up uh, street line. Some building looks like buildings have gone missing because they are missing. And this building on Morton Street was clearly built after 7th Avenue South came about because it has a street line. Uh, 10,000 people, primarily Italian immigrants who didn't have a lot of clout, were pushed out of their houses to make way for 7th Avenue South. For many of them, it felt like you know they were almost crossing the Atlantic again. A huge upheaval. But that's not all, because the same thing happens on 6th Avenue. With the grid, 6th Avenue was only north of Plinker Street, this uh, line of colored yellow. This did not exist. So for two reasons, again, they cut, they moved 10,000 additional people out of their houses on 6th Avenue, running to south of Canal, because someday they're going to build the IND subway the 6th Avenue line, and it's easier from the surface, plus more access from the Holland Tunnel. This was, the, it's, it's, the reading, the writing is upside down here, basically, but this is an article in the New York Times. They demapped a couple of streets. There used to be a Hancock Street, a Congress Street, not gone, but they were gone, uh, to make it very, very wide. I was reading that article uh, the other day, and some of these Italian immigrants said, I pay $15 a month. I can't find any apartment for under $25 a month. How am I going to pay for that? And nobody seemed to care for these people that were just being thrown out of their apartments, hardworking people. What year was it? Uh, the, um, it was 1920. Uh, and here is Fiorello in 1940 opening up the subway. Well, the power broker, uh, Robin Moses, I've heard of oh, My favorite uh, this, uh, description of him is a Barracuda city planner. I heard that. Uh, you know, he did a lot. Well, Ken Jackson at Columbia said the only entity that did as much for and to New York as Robert Moses was God. <laughs> and he did a lot of the highways and he did. Center and Jones Beach, uh, and he became increasingly powerful. He starts in the 1920s. He 
he does Lincoln Center, and he goes and tells some very heavy hitters, including Eleanor Roosevelt, block him for some of his more egregious plans in the 1960s. Uh, he had one fatal flaw. He didn't think the city was about the people. He thought it was about the car. And uh, that's what cut off many of us pedestrians from the waterfront. They become highways. <coughs> And of course, you know his plans for Washington Square. That was what he wanted it to look like. A mm -hmm. uh, parent had a child, you know, very popular with uh, parents of the neighborhood. You take your kid into the park. Now they would have to cross on a bridge to go from one side of Washington Square to the other. Massive highways. Uh, of course, you see traffic coming through Washington Square. The fight to stop that, and it really starts with a lot of the mothers around the square to block that. They not only block the highway, as do some of the Italians of the South Village, some of the artists who begin moving in. Jay Jacobs, of course, was involved in that as well. But they stop all traffic from coming into the park. So they even did more of what they wanted than just block water. Superblocks comes about under Robert Moses, Silver Towers, Washington Square Village. More would have been on uh, the agenda had he not been stopped. <coughs> and of course, more is planned, as you know, uh, filling in the open spaces from Third Street to Houston is what is planned was planned on the east, east part of this, right part of the street. Of course, much of that has been blocked, and it remains to be seen what NYU will be going ahead with. 1969, you know, the Landmarks Commission comes about after the demolition of Penn Station. Penn Station is torn down in 1963, and by the time the public knew what was happening, it was pretty much a fait accompli. Uh, and the railroad felt they could tear it down because railroads were having a very tough time. The federal government was putting tons of money into highways and helped finance uh, traffic, uh, you know, people at the airports and airport subsidies. And the railroads were helping to pay for their competitors with their taxes. And so uh, Pennsylvania Railroad, to survive, decided it's our building, we're tearing it down. But of course, many people said, yeah, but it was my city. And that brings off on the Landmarks Commission. And the second district, I think it's now about 113 landmark districts in the five boroughs, the second district to be protected was uh, Washington Square and Greenwich Village. What was the first district? Brooklyn Heights. Brooklyn Heights. <laughs> people in Brooklyn Heights had already done the research before the Landmarks Commission came about, so when it did, they were ready to go. Um, I always like the, the line, I don't know who I'm quoting, but somebody once said, if developers could do anything they wanted in Manhattan, by now we would be a single building with an airport on the roof <laughs> and somewhere in the basement. And certainly the Landmarks Law goes a long way, uh, even though some, uh, some changes in, in around Washington Square have a lot of uh, antagonists without the landmark law, they couldn't block 25th Avenue, and um, they couldn't really stop 15th Avenue either. But here is the cover of the 1969 Landmarks Report, and the original, uh, the numbers here represent different parts of the book that you can read about all those buildings in the landmark district. It goes up to 13th Street, in some places, east to University Place, west for half of the village to Glen Street, and the other half of the village to Washington Street. And that was the original 1969 plan. Here is the current state of the, the uh, districts. And the southern part of the district that will go down to uh, Canal Street Still not totally protected, but you know it's a hard fight to do it. Even if you do it one piece at a time, uh, that's really what keeps it to a little more human scale than a lot of other parts of the city. So 
come here just to review. The southwest quadrant is Trinity Church, 7th Avenue being pushed through. Barrow uh, is a sign of Trinity Church's property and the angled streets. The northwest quadrant has several names connected to Sir Peter Warren, who used to own the whole thing. Uh, Christopher and Charles, or I have that connection. Abington Square, I have that connection. And uh, all of these other names that have all different uh, connections. The north part, uh, actually it was just north of the square, but when, when Waverly Place was called Sixth Street, that was a grid plan, and that was one decision that decided the city is about real estate, so that's why with all of these east-west streets, because of the, um, the power of the waterfront goes up. And then the area around Washington Square, honoring people, honoring uh, Sir Walter Scott's uh, Waverly novels and all of the generals and the change of uh, Lawrence to Fifth Avenue South, to West Broadway, to LaGuardia, changing all about us every day. And I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you.